Hi, I'm Dan. And I'm Ash. And we're going to talk about the future. We don't know exactly what it'll bring, but we can do our best to be ready for it. Seamless interoperability means that apps work great together and across devices, leveraging Android's multitasking capabilities and resource management. Privacy and security have always been a core part of Android's mission, built on the foundation of app sandboxing, open source code, and open app development. And we're continuing to advance the state of the art. Personalization is at the heart of everything we do, allowing the Android experience to best adapt to the needs and wants of your users. Finally, device hardware keeps evolving and users expect apps to take advantage of it. With all of that in mind, we're going to be walking through how to future-proof your Android development, given what we know from past Android releases and Android 14. Making apps work well together involves how they share resources, how you can move data between them, and much more. So let's talk about the future of running stuff in the background. We have this super simple flowchart. Mm. That can help visualize when you can and should use different methods of running work in the background. It's not inclusive of every use case. First, check to see if there's a purpose-built API for your use case, and use those when possible. Uh, more on this later. Then, if the user initiates the work in the app's UI, is likely to care about what's happening, can control whether the work continues, and the work matches one of Android's service types, you just might want to use a foreground service. Examples include navigation, media playback, audio recording, or workout tracking. Otherwise, most of the time, use Work Manager. Here are the foreground service types known to Android 14. Service permissions and some of the types are new. Apps that target Android 14 need to declare foreground service permissions based on the foreground service types they use, in addition to the core foreground service permission from API 28. Android enforces foreground service types with runtime requirements, such as holding a location runtime permission for foreground services of type location. Here's a manifest snippet for a health and or location service. We declare normal non-runtime permissions for both types, and then we set the type to be health plus location. The service can be started as any combination of these types and must satisfy any runtime requirements for all types it's started as. Short service is a new type of foreground service from Android 14 that only requires the core foreground service permissions. It's for those times when you have to do something relatively short-lived and critical that doesn't match the foreground service criteria, giving your app a much better chance of completing critical tasks before its task is killed or placed into a cached state. A cached state occurs after your app no longer has an active Android component, such as an activity, job, or service. Also in Android 14, once your app is moved into a cached state, within seconds it won't get CPU time, and any broadcasts that it has dynamically registered for may be queued and or merged when delivered. This is how things already work on some devices out there, but now it's standard platform behavior. There are many cases where you might have needed a foreground service in the past to keep your app active, where we now have purpose-built APIs, such as the Companion Device Manager, Picture-in-Picture, chat bubbles, digital car keys, and the ability to start Bluetooth scanning with a pending intent. And we're doing more. For example, Android 14 adds support for user-initiated data transfer jobs that can be scheduled with constraints. They require a notification when active. When internet access goes away, our job stops, and we've chosen to hide the notification. When internet access is restored, our data transfer job continues. In another new example of purpose-built APIs, we're releasing a new Jetpack library that supports call-related background work, simplifies the Telecom Stack API service, and brings backwards compatibility for newly released features. It includes support for seamless audio switching and routing, and call transfer for VOIP apps leveraging the cross-device SDK. More on that later. Also, if you absolutely need to do something at a precise time, exact alarms are how to do it, but they're probably not the solution you're looking for to get your app to do stuff in the background. They're expensive in terms of battery life and therefore have restricted use cases, even more so in Android 14. And periodic work has many advantages in terms of control. Making apps work well together means a lot of things. It's how they share resources, how you can move data between them, and much more. To summarize, look for purpose-built APIs and use Work Manager for most other use cases. There can be magical moments when your devices all work together. The cross-device SDK exits preview this summer, so you can launch cross-device features. 
You can use the SDK to build personal experiences, like the way the Jetpack Telephony API uses the cross-device SDK to transfer a VOIP call from your phone to a tablet, or communal ones, like placing a group food order or sharing a maps location with your cycling buddies. It abstracts wireless technology such as Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and ultra-wideband to create sessions that span devices. We're building a network simulator to help test your cross-device creation that includes features such as changes in device position and packet loss. I'm back to talk about migrating to predictive back. Android 10 introduced gesture navigation, enabling users to swipe to navigate their phone instead of using buttons. Predictive back improved gesture navigation in Android 13 giving a preview of where users are going as they swipe back. Android 14 adds in-app predictive animations. Here you see Reddit prototyping our alpha APIs. Well, that's cool looking, but why would someone want to integrate predictive back? The back-to-home animation not only feels more premium, it can significantly reduce users accidentally leaving apps. The cross-activity animation that you see here with Spotify helps users navigate between two activities in your app. And your app will come to life with predictive animations and five new Material Android components. See the What's New in Material Design talk to learn more. There are two common migration paths. If your app does not intercept back events, all you need to do to get out of the box predictive animations in your app is to upgrade your Android X activity dependency to the latest stable version and opt into the animations in the Android manifest. If your app does intercept back events, you'll also want to stop using key code back or on back pressed. Instead, use back handler with compose or on back press callback with its dispatcher for views. Here are four tips for implementing back handler or on back press callback. First, determine the UI state that enables or disables each callback. In this compose example, we observe the state of our text field in on value change. And when the text is not empty, we enable back handler to handle the back event. Second, use the new predictive back callbacks for UI logic that changes UI state, such as showing a dialog or running an animation. For example, if you've been using the no longer supported on back press method to log back events, moving this logic to the new callbacks disables the predictive animations and makes your code responsible for navigation. Instead, don't create callbacks for logic like this consider logging within the activity or fragment lifecycle instead. Third, create single responsibility callbacks. This means one callback per animation or functionality. This is possible because you can create multiple callbacks. The callbacks are added to a stack. The last added enabled callback will handle the next back gesture with one callback per back gesture. Your call stack looks delicious. Unlike callbacks, the analogy has multiple responsibilities. Last, on Android 14, you can run animations within callbacks for your app's key moments. A key moment Reddit is prototyping is collapsing the post as we swipe back to the feed. Google Chrome is also prototyping previewing the previous web page as we swipe back. This is possible because of onback press callbacks new methods, including handle onback progressed. The back event determines the edge the user is swiping from and the progress of the back gesture as the user swipes back. But what if our app has lots of places that need to be modified to include predictive back? Mm. In Android 14, you can opt in individual activities to focus on migrating the journeys that are most important to your app first. That wraps up predictive back. See our I.O. video from last year and our two developer guides to learn more. And now, back to Dan and the future of privacy and security. The future of privacy is all about designing for safety. And we have a privacy code lab to help your existing app integrate privacy best practices. In the spirit of designing for safety, here are just some of the privacy-related features we've added to Android recently. And Android 14 continues this trend, with features such as safety labels and permissions, as well as empowering users to grant apps access to selected media when they request media permissions. Google Play requires new apps and app updates to target recent SDK versions to maximize privacy and security. It's why, starting with Android 14, apps with a target SDK version lower than 23 can't be installed. Also, make sure SDKs you use target recent SDK versions, and use data auditing APIs to give your transparency into private data your SDKs might be accessing. What's new in Android privacy and security covers the Android 14 privacy and security changes in detail, as well as common issues apps have. If you use or build ad services, the Privacy Sandbox Talk has everything you need to know to work with privacy-preserving ads technology. 
And if you generate and or use health data, learn how Health Connect allows for apps and services to share health data with privacy and data controls. Allowing a user to seamlessly transition to a new device in a secure, privacy-preserving way is important in retaining users. And Android 12 changed backups for the better, allowing for separate configuration for cloud backups versus device-to-device -device backups, while still supporting the legacy key value pair ones. Does testing this require wiping devices? Well, that's one way of testing it. But using some simple shell scripts, you can test all three backup types without having to reset devices. These scripts call into the Backup Manager from ADB to initialize and create a backup of the requested type. Uninstall and reinstall the app, and then clean up and return things back to normal. The Android developer site has much more, including how to troubleshoot exceeded quotas and timeouts in the testing backup topic. Restoring user credentials is key when a user transitions to a new device, and the new Jetpack Credential Manager API supports passwordless authentication with passkeys, the future of sign-in, as well as legacy methods of authentication to simplify restoring account information and authenticating new users. The talk on passkey support covers it all. Android has always allowed users to customize their experience, and your apps can help. Start by getting your app onto the most important phone real estate, Refresh your widget to increase the chance users will add it to their home screens. Jetpack Glance, now in beta, simplifies the development of widgets using Compose's declarative syntax to abstract the complexities of working directly with remote views. Take this weather widget, for example. With Glance, we can partition the UI into discrete composables. And this talk has more guidance on building great widgets. Ooh, pretty. Uh, how can I get my app icon to do that? You can create a themed app icon. <laughs> in your existing adaptive icon XML, you'll see background and foreground layers. To add support for themed app icons, add a third monochrome layer that points to a drawable. If your app icon is already simple, your monochrome and foreground drawables can be the same. The new Android Studio tooling in Flamingo and above previews what your themed app icon will look like. And you're done. Our team has also added new icon design-focused resources, a Figma template, and CodeLab. Android 14 improves per app preferences. Android 13 offered a central place for multilingual users to set preferred app languages in device settings. To support this feature, you previously created and maintained a file that listed out every locale your app supports. Now we can generate this file for you. All you need to do is use Android Studio Giraffe or above, upgrade your Android Gradle plugin, tell us what your app's default locale is in, opt in, and remove the file you may have manually created. The user sees the list of languages your app supports within their device settings, but now with less work. Oof, that's a lot of languages. Can we customize it? Yep. You can customize the set of languages users see. Say you would like to A-B test supporting Bengali before rolling Bengali out to most users. In this case, one group of users will receive Bengali as a selectable language, and another group will not. Using a backend like Firebase Remote Config lets us change aspects of our app server side, like the list of languages. We then use Locale Manager to override the Locale Config with the language tags we receive from the server. Also, for user customization of regional preferences, such as temperature or days of the week, see the new backward-compatible Locale Preferences library. The new grammatical inflection API in Android 14 helps create a personalized UI for all users. Three billion people speak a gendered language, in which words inflect or change according to the gender of the person being referred to. The default inflection is often masculine, but this may feel less relatable to some users. According to experts, a gender-inflected UI respects all genders and may improve users' comprehension, engagement, and preference to your app. A gender-inflected UI is useful in much of the world and is particularly important for users living in the darker colored regions on this map. In Android 14, use the Grammatical Inflection API to create new gender-qualified string resources, such as feminine, masculine, and neuter alternatives. Then, use the Grammatical Inflection Manager to set the application to the correct grammatical gender for your user. Finally, make sure your app experience can be personalized to meet users' accessibility needs. Android 14 adds nonlinear font scaling, which scales up larger text more slowly than hard-to-read small text in response to user preferences, which means you should avoid static SP calculations and make sure to use the type-to-value methods to convert between SP and PX. And the What's New in Android Accessibility talk has more of what we're doing in all of these areas. App Actions enable voice commands from Google Assistant to deep link into the most interesting and useful points in your app, and makes your app that much more accessible in the process. 
And while you're thinking about deep linking, Android app links allow your mobile website to immediately open the richer, more engaging content in your Android app. The deep linking talk covers the basics of creating, testing, and troubleshooting Android app links. There's lots that we just don't know about the future of hardware. But one thing that history has shown us is that many features that were once premium only became mainstream. Premium devices have HDR displays that can display more colors with more contrast, and they typically have camera hardware that can capture video and images in formats that utilize these displays. HDR images are new to Android 14 and use a separate gain map to preserve the enhanced colors from the camera hardware. You can opt your activity into displaying HDR images by specifying a manifest entry for your activity or by dynamically setting the color mode for your activity window. The Android HDR format extends JPEG in a backwards compatible way, so the work of decoding and displaying these images is largely done for you. Image processing pipelines will have to take this format into account, however. Check out the talk on building premium camera experiences, which covers capturing HDR video, optimizing for stream use cases such as video calling, video recording, or still image capture. And the rest of the premium media story is covered in the High Quality Media Experiences talk, which covers how to use the Transformer API to transcode video, along with spatial audio, media 3, and video streaming and editing. More and more premium devices are devices that transform, and hardware manufacturers are coming up with new ways to give users devices with larger displays that are pocketable. With larger screens, users are expecting devices to be productivity machines, compatible with different input sources like stylus, touchpad, mouse, and keyboard. And Android 14 adds automatic layout configuration for keyboards, improved touchpad gesture detection, advanced stylus motion prediction, and more. So expect more users to have these input devices. And if you want to support drawing, particularly with a stylus, the low latency Jetpack library is the way to go, supporting front buffered rendering when hardware supports it. This talk covers input as well as user interface and multitasking for large screens. In the near future, Android is moving towards having 64-bit only devices. Hybrid devices that support 32-bit and 64-bit code are going away soon. And in the future, expect to only see 64-bit devices. For more information on how to test your app, information on potential incompatibilities and more, watch Keep Your App From Failing in a 64-bit only world. As hardware gets more capable, our devices are going to get smarter with the use of on-device ML. ML Kit provides turnkey features, such as barcode scanning, translation, and smart replies. Face Mesh is in beta, and Document Scanner is coming soon. The Acceleration service runs an on-device benchmark with your model and data sample, returning a hardware configuration recommendation that you can apply to your TensorFlow Lite interpreter. It supports inference on CPUs and GPUs today, and the future plan is to add more core types. The on-device machine learning talk has lots more detail on hardware acceleration, ML kit, and more. And that brings us to the end of our talk. Building for the future means building responsibly, considering system health, interoperability, privacy, and security. It means working for a more personal, adaptable Android. And it means taking advantage of the hardware and software innovation in premium devices today, which will likely be the hardware in mainstream devices tomorrow. There's one last thing. There's always one last thing. <laughs> Ultimately, what we're advocating in this talk falls under three of the key pillars in Google Play's new quality framework. To learn more about these pillars and the rest, check out what great quality looks like on Google Play. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm curiously hungry for pancakes. Nice callback. <laughs>